In this video, what we'd like to do is discuss the DC circuit behavior of capacitors and inductors and sort of compare and contrast them a little bit. So again, if you put capacitors and or inductors in different DC circuits, how do they behave? So the circuit that we'll choose just to make things a bit interesting are sort of ones that look like these here. Well, you'll notice the circuits are identical other than the fact that there's a capacitor or inductors and vice versa. So in both circuits here, I have a battery here, a DC battery supplying some voltage V, which sort of pumps the electrons around. I have a resistor here, we can call it maybe R1, and here's R1. We can call this R2, and this can be R2 down here. So just really identical looking circuits, no real difference between them at all. We can call this R3, we can call this R3. But now the only difference between them is that this capacitor, this circuit here has a capacitor sitting here, this one has an inductor sitting here. And so what we'd like to look at in this particular video here is the short time and long time behavior of these systems here. So that's really the, where there's actually some kind of interesting uh, features in there. That's what we'd like to take a look at here. So the first thing that we'll look at here, number one, is short time behavior. And number two is long time behavior. So that's what we'll look at here. And by short time, of course, we mean really short times here, something like T is equal to zero. So you get these inductors and capacitors right out of the box and put them in a circuit and just before any current hits them, right there, T is equal to zero. And long time, of course, refers to when time goes to infinity. So things have really settled down. They've been on for a long time. So what we'll do also further, maybe to prime the, uh, the idea here, is we will put a switch in these circuits. Let me just put a little break in here, which takes the battery out. And we'll just put a big switch right here. So if you can imagine then the uh, sort of the cartoon version of a switch here is what will happen is when I give this a push down and this a push down, then things can happen. That will be T is equal to zero. So our short time behavior will be, well, what's going on in these circuits when the switch was just closed? That's short time. And then we'll say, well, what's going on in the circuits after the switch has been closed for a very long time? That's sort of what we're going to do here. Okay, so let's just get right into it then. So what we'll do then is we'll talk about the capacitor circuit first, and we'll try to talk about what happens in this capacitor circuit, say, right after the switch is closed. Then we'll get to the inductor one, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, so here's the way it works. Initially, remember, at T is equal to zero, so the short time behavior here, I guess what we'll talk about first. When T is equal to zero, remember, the capacitor is completely uncharged. There's no charge on it. So there's no charge on the capacitor because it's like brand new out of the box or has never been quite connected to a battery yet. Remember that uh, V is equal to Q over C. Oops. V is equal to Q over C. So what that means then, if there's no charge on the capacitor, if Q is zero because it's brand new, there'll be no voltage drop across it either. And there's your first clue right there about how capacitors behave in the short time. Namely, if Q is equal to zero, V is equal to zero. This simple fact sort of allows you to predict or tell what the capacitor is going to do for a very short time. Let's go back up to the circuit here. V is equal to zero. What that means then is if you put a voltmeter across this capacitor right here in this region right here, so you have a meter and you put it right across the capacitor just as the switch is closed here, it's going to read zero. Even though it's a component in a system, it has no voltage drop across it. So what does that mean, no voltage drop across it? Well, other things in circuits that have no voltage drop across them, can you think of anything in a circuit that has no voltage drop across it? Like where else could I go in a circuit like this and get no voltage drop across it if I measured it with a meter? How about across the battery? No, I'd get a voltage there for sure. How about across the resistor? No, I'd get a voltage there because of Ohm's law. When the battery's closed, current's flowing. How about here? Voltage there too. How about right here across these wires here? Or how about across these two wires here? Or in here, anywhere these things are connected. So it turns out that open or just straight pieces of wire like that have no voltage drop across them. There's one aspect of a circuit that can have no voltage drop across it, just a straight piece of wire. So really what that does, tells you then is that when the switch is just closed then, the capacitor is behaving very much like a straight piece of wire. There's no voltage drop across the capacitor at all. It couldn't have possibly done anything with any current or any charge or anything like that if there's no voltage drop across it. So this capacitor, as far as we can tell, is behaving like this piece of wire between my fingers right here. No difference at all. The other thing way you can think about it is as follows here. The, the voltage that ends up being across R3 and C here is actually the voltage across R2 because the, these because R2 here and R3 and C are connected in parallel like that. So what that means then is the voltage across R2 is equal to the voltage across R3 and C, but the voltage across C is zero. What that means is that 
all the voltage is actually sitting here across R3. So if R2 and R3 would have the same voltage across them, it's almost like the capacitor isn't there. And so that's sort of the conclusion here. For short times, it's like the capacitor is a wire. So for very short times, it is true, this circuit here, with all these resistors in here, I don't know what you think of them, any confusion can be drawn like this. We just take the capacitor out. So this is going to be an R3, this is going to be an R1, and that's going to be an R2. The capacitor is just gone. This is the way this, the circuit behaves electrically when this switch is closed for very, very short times after that. Right there, T is equal to zero. Now, what happens as time goes on? So you can, so then you can analyze the circuit as needed here. The question in your book might say something like, what is the current in R1 just after the switch is closed? You redraw the circuit like this and get at it. Any, any analytical technique you can think of is fair game because the capacitor is out of circuit, out of the circuit. But of course, you know how capacitors behave. After they've been connected to a circuit for a while, what will start to happen to the capacitor is start charge will start to accumulate on the capacitor's place because that's what they do. They store charge. And when that happens, it's no longer true that the voltage across the capacitor will be zero. And I know that because, again, V is Q over C. If Q is not equal to zero, then the voltage will not be zero. And so the capacitor can start sort of acquiring a voltage difference across it. So any way we discussed it, the capacitor no longer behaves like this piece of wire between my hands here, between my fingers. The voltage across my fingertips will still be zero, straight piece of, an, of a conductor, not so for the capacitor here. And we know that because the, the charge, as the capacitor starts to charge up, the charge on it just follows that charging equation that we covered in a previous video, which is something like this, T over RC. This is the capacitor charging equation, and we know what it looks like. It looks like this. Here's a function of time. The charge on the capacitor starts to look like this. But if the voltage is the charge divided by the capacitance, the voltage is going to have a very similar characteristic-looking curve here, because remember, if you just divide by C, you'll get voltage. So it'll just sort of shift the curve down a bit, you know, or up. it'll just sort of rescale this curve, but it'll have the same general shape like that, so the voltage starts to build. Kind of hard to predict what'll happen at a very specific time, because you'd have to plug the time into this exact equation here, understand exactly the, the RC setting of the capacitor and that sort of thing. bit difficult to, to choose here, so often we sort of skip the intermediaries. We understand the short-term behaviors, the capacitor's like it's not even the circuit. The long-term behavior, that's the next thing. What sort of long-term behavior do we get here? So what... If, what do we get in a circle like this as time goes to infinity? That's the next question. Well, what happens when time goes to infinity is that the capacitor here is full. What does full mean? Capacitor is full means it's like no longer accepting charge. It's no longer letting charge flow into the place. So you have to think, well, what does that mean now exactly? Okay, well, remember that the the current, the Q, the charge flowing on the capacitor place, we just discussed it, sort of follows the equation like this. And we even wrote the equation up there. It's Q naught times the quantity 1 minus E to the minus T over RC. But remember now that current flow is dQ dT. So current flow is the derivative of that with respect to time. So if we looked at the current flow then, the current as a function of time would just be some overall amplitude E to the minus T over RC. I'll let you sort of worry about the exact proof of that, but if you differentiate the charging equation with respect to time once, you'll get the current equation. And if you look very carefully at this here, as T goes to infinity, the current's going to drop to zero. And so that's the interesting part about capacitors in the long time limit here. That switches, they've been sitting in circuits for a very long time. Common sense, they're full, they're no, lo no longer accepting charge. Mathematically speaking, the current goes to zero. But that's sort of the same thing as no longer accepting charge. So if you were current in this particular circuit right here, you'd be sitting here and the switch would be closed. If you were current, you'd come to this junction here. And what, is, what do currents do at the junction? Well, they split. Some current will go down this way. Other current will go this way. But if you have a capacitor here that's no longer accepting charge, it's full. Or alternatively, the current through the capacitor has dropped to zero. That's another analysis right here. The current has dropped to zero. Then what happens here is this current here let's just call it, I don't know, like I prime or something that decided to go into this branch here must become zero also because ultimately this I prime is the current that goes through the resistor and wants to go and charge the capacitor. But if the capacitor is full, it's saying, sorry, I don't want any more charge. No current flows through this branch at all. And so there's your behavior for capacitors in the long term. It's no longer accepting charge. The current through the capacitor goes to zero.
And remember something about, about uh, electrical components that are in series. They all have the same current. That's the definition of series there. Same current flowing through them. So if the current in the capacitor goes to zero, whatever it's in series with, the current through those devices are going to go to zero also. Because if the capacitor's current goes to zero and the same series is defined as devices with the same current flowing through them, stands to reason if the current's going to be zero in the capacitor, it's going to be zero in all the other elements as well. So in the long-term limit here, you can redraw your circuit with this entire branch just removed. Even though physically they're still there, there's no current flow in the branch, so to the circuit, it's not doing anything. Your entire circuit becomes this one right here. So if the question asks something like, what is the current through R2, R2 a long time after the switch has been closed, that's how you get your answer out. So there's the, your facts for capacitors there, and we'll wrap up at the very end of the video here. But now let's look at the same circuit again, but put that inductor in there, see what it does, because inductors have sort of that funny current resisting property here. So here's the switch. Here's the resistor. Here's that other resistor like that, and we have this other resistor here just for fun. And there's your inductor right there. There's your L right there. And so the usual thing, you can call this R1 and R2 and R3, and there's your inductor sitting there. Okay, so what do we get now? Well, what we have to remember is that the properties of inductance is here. In particular, I guess we'll write that the voltage across the inductor here is minus L times DI dt. Something like that. Okay. So what happens here is, again, we think of this branch right here, and we think of the current that gets directed down this way to the branch. We'll call it I prime here. So as we discussed in the video on inductors right here, these elements are in series here. So what will happen is the current will try to flow down here. Um, who knows exactly what happens? Maybe some charge or some current sort of tr trickles through this resistor here, but then it hits this inductor. And what we saw in that video on inductors right here is that initially, the current in the inductor, even when it has voltage across it, so the, the current in the inductor here, T is equal to zero, is going to be zero. Because what are we doing here? This is where this maximal change in current is trying to occur. We're trying to go from zero current in the inductor to some steady state amount that the battery is forcing or imposing on all the circuit elements in the, in the circuit there, depending on the arrangement right there. But unfortunately, the inductor is just resisting all of that change in current. It doesn't want to go from the no current state to some current state. Now, it eventually always loses because the battery doesn't give up. The battery keeps pumping it in. But we're just saying in that short time limit, immediately when the switch is closed, the inductor is resisting all current. So if this voltage across the inductor here is sort of maximum right here, then what that means, though, is the current in the inductor is equal to zero. But only a T is equal to zero. It's not letting any current flow. And remember, like when the capacitor is here, objects in series have the same current flow in them. That's what series means. Same current. Same current going through there. So if the current in the inductor is zero, the current in the resistor must also be zero. So you're thinking, oh yeah, it behaves just like the inductor, just like the capacitor. No, it isn't just like the capacitor, because remember, this is the short-term limit here. This is when T is equal to zero, just as the switch is closed. So when T is equal to zero, you may redraw your, your inductor circuit like this, because that inductor isn't allowing any current to flow in itself or anything it's connected in series with, with, which includes that other resistor in there. So this is what your inductance circuit looks like at T is equal to zero. Look at the long time. Let's just put the circuit elements back in there now. Here's that inductor sitting here. What happens in the long term limit here? What happens when T goes to infinity now? Well, when T goes to infinity, let's just say that the inductor here has lost. Yes, it has that DI DT and it very much tries to oppose changes in current, but it eventually loses. It doesn't have like its own battery or power source. It's sort of more of a transient effect in there. The battery will always win. So what will happen in the long term here, let's just say in the very long term here when the current is all done, the current just becomes constant. It's a DC circuit after all. It's just a battery driving here, a DC battery. There's no alternating, no switches being open or closed, just the switch is closed. And it's a DC case. So eventually the current does become constant. There will be a constant current flowing through these resistors and through the resistor and the inductor right there. And remember, when current is constant, di dt is equal to zero. And if di dt is equal to zero, then the voltage across the inductor is going to be zero too, because remember, the voltage across the inductor is proportional to di dt. So the change in current is zero, the voltage across the inductor is going to be zero also. And you go back to the really the, the video about the capacitor when we asked the question, what types of circuits or what areas of circuits have no voltage across them? Well, those are things like wires. So in other words, for the very long term here, 
the, the inductor behaves like this piece of wire between my fingertips. There's no voltage drop across my fingertips because it's all one continuous wire. The inductor starts behaving the same way. Or if there's some voltage that is built up across R2 here, since this resistor and the inductor are also across R2, the voltage across this, this pair will be the same as across this, induct, this resistor right here. But because the voltage across this inductor right here has reached zero in the long-term steady state here, it's like the inductor isn't even there. So cut to the chase, in the very long-term limit here, it's like the inductor isn't even there. This is what the T is equal to infinity induction circuit looks like. So this will still be R3. The resistance property has never changed, but now you may analyze your circuit because it looks just like this in the long-term limit. So to recap then, let's see if we can just build a table here sort of spontaneously here. Here's T is equal to zero. Here's T is equal to infinity, and there's your capacitor, and here's your inductor. Let's see if we can fill in about them like this. Something like this. All right, here we go. So in the short-term limit like this, when the capacitor is completely uncharged, it's like it's not even in the circuit. It's like it's gone. But for the long-time limit here, it stops current because it doesn't want to charge the capacitor fully. Think about it that way. So for T is equal to zero, you can just pretend the capacitor is not there, but as it starts to charge up and it gets fully charged, it stops current in its branch. As we saw in the circuit, it just completely shuts it down. Now the short-term limit for the in inductor right there is that it stops current in the short-time limit as we saw. In other words, in this case here, that DI, DT, the change in current with respect to time, is so large because you're trying to take a an inductor which is sitting there with no current traveling and get it all ramped up here, it just stops everything just instantaneously. That right there is T is equal to zero. But of course, of course, for the long term, it's like it's gone. So you see sort of this, this weird little symmetry between the capacitors and inductors. In other words, capacitors at short time behave like inductors at long time. And inductors at long time behave like capacitors in short time and that sort of thing. So you can look at it any way you want, but this is sort of the summary of the table. So anyway, this sort of summarizes what happens to capacitors and inductors as they sit in DC circuits. Careful with your textbook problems because they often only ask for the short time and the long time limits. And that sort of logic that we went through in this video here will help you to sort of nail those down.